Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm talking with Mr. Ron Danette about George Way drums. Ron, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm glad you're here, man. You're a, a legend in the industry, um, both with being the owner of George Way Drums, but just your Danette Classic Drums um, as a brand is just innovative, and, and I think everyone just loves and respects it. Well, I never know how to respond when someone says legend or um, anything like that. It always makes me feel a little um, slightly uncomfortable because I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, celebrate <laughs> celebrate that when I'm gone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I still I still got a long way to go, but I do appreciate it. I really do. Absolutely. Um, so we're talking today about George Way and. Um, I get messages from people fairly often saying like, hey, I keep hearing you talk about um, George Way. And they'll say, who is he? And, and he's come up in episodes um, that people can check out, uh, like such as an episode about um, Leedy early on with Rob Cook. He was involved in the Camco episode, which obviously we'll talk about. Um, I know you mentioned that maybe you're not the guy who to go with specific on uh, – you know, where he was born and where he went to kindergarten and uh, what kind of baby food he ate and stuff like that. <laughs> but like, yeah. um, but just broad strokes, why don't you tell us who is George Way? Why should we care about him? And uh, what what is his involvement in the drum world? Wow. Um, that's a huge question. And I really don't know where to start. But um, George is in a in a in a nutshell, he is the, uh, I've, I've, I've got a number of names that I uh, call him by. He's the, the godfather of the modern drum set. Okay. He is the Leonardo da Vinci of, of, of the mechanics and design of, of the modern drum set. And, um, uh, uh he, he's important on, on so many levels. Um, and uh, well, I, I, I'm just back from New Orleans where I was at Stan Moore's uh, drum camp and um, someone asked about him and I, and I said, there's not a person in this room, there's not a drummer alive today that doesn't owe George a, a, a debt of gratitude because whatever brand of drum you're playing today, I don't care what it is, you're using one of his ideas. Yeah. Um, somewhere, somehow along the way. Um, and, and there were just so many of them. I, the, the one that comes to mind uh, off the top of my head, the one that really stands out is, is the swivel nut. Um, and if, if I can explain that, it's the threaded insert that goes into a lug that sort of is self-aligns. And um, when I inherited or when Rob Cook um, passed along uh, all of George's estate, included in there were um, just really important historical drawings of some of the stuff he did. And there's a pencil on paper drawing in there dated 1917, in which he was drawing out versions of that particular idea to the point where I looked at it and I went, the version that he drew is actually the one that we use now. He he actually skipped through all of the lug styles where 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 manufacturers used to use springs on the inside and felt. Yeah. Generally speaking, now uh, that swivel nut is held in place by a little rubber insert that sort of fits in and holds it in place. He he drew that in 1917. Mm. So he's an unbelievably innovative and. Uh way ahead of his time on a lot of this stuff way ahead of his time and 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 no pun intended there with with his name but he was um yeah. there are a bunch of things that that are are, are credit to him he was really the first uh, uh drum manufacturer to use i i believe what was then called pyroline but we know it better as as a as a marine pearl wrap he was the first one to do it he was the one that popularized it, and um, and we still have it going today. All of those wrap finishes, white marine pearl. Uh, that was uh, that was George, Jeez. and uh, some some of that information on 
that particular company that was making that pyrrole was was also included in those archives that I received. Wow. Now, let me ask you this. So he he famously has worked with multiple different drum companies. Uh, so he was basically a an employee of, I know it was companies such as Leedy, Slingerland, Leedy and Ludwig. And then he started his own company, which kind of then became Camco. But um, was Leedy, do you know, is Leedy the first um, company he actually was employed by to be, you know, a, a, a drum worker? Actually, um and I'm I'm going to rely on the history here. He actually started uh, with uh, uh, George Stone. Of, okay. Uh, of uh, and he had, you know, of course Stone has his own um, uh, legacy. That's Boston, right? Yep. Cool. Yeah, and uh, they started working together, making you know uh, sound effects of the time. And there, there's a famous picture of them with these little things that made. Uh, 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 sounds, you know, um, pig squeals and, you know, those, those vaudevillian sound effects. In, in, again, in broad, big chunks, he eventually uh, ended up in Edmonton, Canada, working at the uh, Pantages Theater there. And, and that's where things really started happening for him. He, uh, you know, in addition to being a, the drummer for that particular, you know, uh, entertainment scene, uh, he worked with one of the, uh, I, I believe he was a boilerman there, uh, uh, who, who worked at the theater and, um, he started making snare drums and it was actually in Edmonton, Canada, where he really started, uh, with what was known as the advanced drum company. And, um, over the last few years, I've been, uh, I've, I've discovered, uh, a few of these advanced snare drums, even a wooden one. And there are a few archival pictures of him, you know, working at this advanced drum company, but I have a couple of those uh, snare drums. And even then, George was so far ahead of his time. Uh, when everyone was using two lugs, he used one of his early renderings, uh, versions of a, of a swivel lug. Now it only, it, it didn't swivel 360 degrees, but it was definitely self-aligning. It sort of moved uh, um, at a 90 degree angle to the shell. And it was this amazingly simple lug design on a metal drum shell. And, uh, you know, it said, you know, the advanced drum company, Edmonton, Alberta. It, it was there that he um, started uh, attracting the attention of uh, Ulysses Leedy. And uh, Leedy made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, and so uh, George and Elsie, his wife, whom he met uh, while working in Edmonton, um, went to work for Leedy. And that's where it all began. I don't know if, if any of your listeners know this, and they, uh, they probably won't, but they may have seen uh, at some point in time, there was a, a collection of advertising materials that was called Liddy Drum Topics. Yeah, no, no, no. That's uh, I've, I've posted some pictures of it. That's very uh, popular, you know, <laughs> amongst the yes, the drum folks. Amazing stuff. Some of the uh, it was it was basically a magazine that that Liddy had put out. Now, now here's where it gets really interesting, at least from my perspective, because with my companies, uh, one of the things that's been a piece of the success of Danette Classic and, and and George Way is that uh, all of the graphic design stuff, um, all of the advertising, all of the photography, all of those catchy, silly little ads, those tongue-in-cheek things that I do from time to time, everything, that's all done in-house. And George w was actually a magnificent graphic designer. And again, in with, with his archives, or all of the tools that a graphic designer would have used back in the day. And he applied, he, he was an artist. His skills were, you know, just from my perspective, you know, with working with computers and cameras, looking back on what he was doing, and I'm going, oh my God, like, I got a lot of parallels with this guy, yeah. and this is a big one. Yeah. There were, there were jars of paint, uh, lettering, books on calligraphy, um, and there were some beautiful 
original examples of his work. You know, that genius went as far as all of his handwritten notes, everything was, uh, it, it wasn't done in cursive. It was all printed. God, that's wild. What a renaissance man, you know, like a, just a guy uh, who can do everything. You said it right there. That That's probably the best single word to describe him. He was a renaissance man. Hmm. And, um, and he covered just every base, you know, like, yeah, he was a, 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 a drum designer that was forward thinking and, and um, just had so many ideas, but the marketing concepts, the graphic design, and and then you read those leady topics and what they were saying. And actually even some of the letters, and, and again, I keep referring to these archives that I got from Rob Cook, but uh, there are letters in there and uh, uh, exchanges between him and leady and him and, um, many of the other people that he had, had worked with throughout his career. And he, he had a, a, an understanding of, I guess you would call it customer service mm, yeah. that just tied everything in. He was all about quality, the quality of the drum and, and, and customer service. So again, yeah, that's the word Renaissance, man. He, he, his, yeah. his genius wasn't just limited to, hey, I can, I can wrap a drum in uh, Marine Pearl, or I, am I, uh, I think it's Roth needs uh, a parallel release instead of just unhinging it one side kind of thing. So. Yeah. Well, and it seems like to me he's he's actually uh, not to oversimplify, but he's seen drummers as people who are very passionate about their instrument because we're we're very early on in the drum set in this point in time, if not in the advent of it being created. So he's like, like we're doing right now. We're talking to people, people listening like this to this are obsessed with the drums like us and they love it. And like the leady topics, um, like his, his publications are just to promote drums. I mean, it just gets people more jazzed up about drums. And, uh, and, and I think we have the, him to thank for a lot of that kind of, uh, you know, really instilling this love of drums with, with people. Yep. I, you know, and I'll tie this in with your listeners a little bit, especially the uh, the younger ones. But um, like you asked me at the beginning, why is he important? And what occurred to me was that, um, and again, something that it's common knowledge out there, but George came from a very wealthy family. And he made a decision very early in life that what he wanted to do was be a drummer mm. and it and if you read uh rob's book uh the leady way he tells the story in there of how his um father rejected that um and wasn't particularly um gentle in how he spoke to george about it and george just turned his back on what could have been a very comfortable lifestyle and decided, no, I'm going to be a, you know, and he quite literally ran away and joined the circus and, wow. and never looked back. And, and when you think about it today, I go, how many times since that happened with George, has that story been told and retold and retold and lived and experienced by every drummer who at one point in time is like, you know, been up against it or discouraged and just made that decision and said, you know what? No, I'm, this is me. This is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I'm making the commitment to myself and yeah, I'm going ahead with it. That's sorry, amazing. mom. Sorry, dad. This is what, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. Yeah. You know, I've seen here on an article too. It's just so people know he was born in 1891 as uh, George Harrison Bassett. I believe in San Francisco and it looks like his um, mother, they got, his mother got, they, his parents got divorced and remarried and that's when uh, I guess his stepfather's name, last name was way. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Just that, that kind of, there's the, the very far background. But um, so I'm also on waydrums.com, W A Y drums.com, your website. And you have a really good history on here. And it's interesting too. I, like, like the first little, like, um, invention thing I'm, I'm seeing is 1927 George introduced the Chinese sneeze symbol 
which is seen today as the modern China symbol, uh, China type symbol. Um, he's creating things even then, obviously he's, he's making new products. Well, he is, my understanding is, is he didn't actually make those, but he, um, was responsible for, uh, um, as far as I understand, introducing them and, and popularizing them. Of sure. course, you know, that around that time that vaudeville, uh, and the music of the era were looking for, you know, they didn't have the stuff that we have now. So they were going through the evolution of the drum kit and we're using, you know, temple blocks and cowbells and, uh, symbols obviously. And, and so that's where that China sort of cool comes into the picture. And China's go way back into for thousands of years to Chinese, um, you know, parades and all that stuff. But, but you do see a lot of these, these trap drummers and the vaudevillian stuff with having a China. So I'm sure that's pretty cool mm-hmm. that, I mean, it became a staple of, uh, of the drum set there, but cool. So he's with Leedy. Then what happens from there? Um, he, does he, does he make a switch soon? Ultimately, uh, he went on to work for basically every drum company that, you know, the chronology went, um, he, he was offered positions with, um, Rogers Slingerland, um, you know, Ludwig and Ludwig, pretty much any drum company at the time. But, but, but the bulk of his career was spent with, uh, with Leedy. Okay. And Leedy, if I'm not mistaken, remembering from Rob's episode was at that point, like the biggest drum manufacturer in the world. And they would create all these, you know, they were huge and the, the factory was like a city block long and, um, and they were just massive. And, uh, like many companies, they went the way of being sold to someone and, then it became Leedy and Ludwig and all that stuff. But, um, okay. Cause he's obviously very closely tied to Leedy. And, and not all of it was, was good. Um, I, I know that at one point he had gone to work for Rogers and, and, you know, I, I think at that point was really being, um, underappreciated and, um, I always remember looking back, you know, plugging in after reading some of his letters uh, that he had written about how um, disenchanted he was with it, that he was caught up in some fairly quick moving changes um, as things were, you know, later in his career. And my takeaway from it was that he was unhappy there because he felt that all of the drum manufacturers or many of them at the time had really lost. um, It was, I guess what I'd call the beginning of the commoditization of, of the drums, Mm -hmm. you know, where it was like, yeah, we don't care about, you know, don't worry about the quality. Let's just kind of get the stuff out of here. And, don't worry about the customer service thing. You know, we'll just get the sales rep to deal with that. And it was, um, I guess it was this, uh, moving away that really, when you think about it, it hasn't stopped evolving since then. And, um, I think, you know, as history repeats itself, it really does as you, I think what he was going through then is pretty much, you know, part of, it's almost um, synonymous, if you will, with what's happening now with big box stores and online sales and, yeah. you know, Amazon and uh, uh, and that kind of thing where, um, yeah. you know, oh, hey, there's a there's an, a, a brand exit kit at Walmart for, <laughs> you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But to be optimistic, there's uh, there's people like you and there's the. Um without naming other brands, cause I'm going to forget people. There's, there's a lot of boutique brands out there who are creating beautiful drums. Um, so, you know, there's, there's always that side of it as well. But, uh, I do think that the big, the big boys have gone to, you know, you have your Taiwan made, um, drums or they're made in China or something like that. So it's, it is more commoditized, um, now. I, I, I well, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because, um, and I, and I do have to mention this. I, Taiwan and to a greater and or lesser extent, China are, um, they're a big part 
of the industry. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, especially with Taiwan, it's not a bad thing. And, and, and I think that the stigma of, you know, made in Taiwan, having been traveled there three times, visited the factories and seen how um, things work. I, I, I've been to factories where they are as passionate about it, if not more so than people on this side of the water. Hmm. Um, yeah. They care what they're doing, um, you know, state of the art uh, uh, machinery and production. So that's, that's lesser of, of, of the angle that I was taking on that. It was more about the, um, less about the manufacturing and more about, um, the sale Got it. of, of, of uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm very glad you just said that though, because I think there is a stigma around it. And from a guy who's traveled there and has seen the industry, that's, uh, very good to know that that actually is just very passionate people. So, um, I appreciate you kind of shining that light yeah. on that. It's, I, I guess what, what, what George was talking about was the, what was the buying experience, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, um, the manufacturing thing. And you have to keep in mind, and, and I, I, I run into this all the time, uh, and a guy's going, well, George wouldn't have done this and George wouldn't have done that. And <laughs> it, yeah. it's been a really good lesson for me going, yeah, but I'm picking up where George left off. And I'm not trying to bury myself in a time capsule and, and, and ignore the progressions of the company where it would have been had George not lost it as he did and, um, and had, you know, gone on to be successful. Yeah. So I go, well, things change and the way things are made changed and, um, it, it, it is what it is now. And, um, I make no apologies for that. And you know what, quite frankly, neither does anybody else. Um, and, and the only, and the only time that, um, I've seen that happen. Um, it, it bothers me mm -hmm. <laughs> because I find it, uh, I find it, uh, disingenuous and, um, yeah. Uh, he kept moving forward and that'd be almost out of character for the company to be frozen in time in 1955 or wherever, like it needs to move forward. That's what George was all about. Right. Well, I, I mean, one of the, uh, let me give you an example here. One of the, one of the famous books that, that Rob put out was um, George's little black book. And it's interesting just from a historic perspective, because anybody who gets into this business understands that sourcing is a big thing. Um, you know, and some of those, some of those sources are very closely guarded. Um, back when George started, there was no internet. I mean, I mean, it was a, it would be word of mouth or a phone book or a shot in the dark, you know, just trying to find somebody to make this. Or, or do this, or what industry can provide the wing nut that I need? Um, and so he created this book. It's like basically a handheld, handwritten internet of all of his suppliers. And you look at it now, and it's um, it's a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, than it was what it was back then, and and geez, you know, the only guy that I can think of who's done anything remotely close to what George did is uh, is Don Lombardi. Um, whom I have the, you know, he's a, he's a dear friend and I have the greatest respect for him, but you, you even look back when, where he picked up with, you know, with taking over, um, you know, basically where Camco left off. Yeah. Um, again, there was no internet then he was facing the same kind of thing. So, mm, sure. So, yeah. So let's back up a little bit here. And, uh, so I'm on your, like you said, I'm on the history on your website here. It says, um, he was downsized during World War II from Leedy because everything changed. Leedy probably switched over to making whatever, you know, things for the war. Um, now, because he infamously, as, as we know, he created the George Way Drum Company. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how the actual creation of the George Way Drum Company started from being an employee of all the companies? How did he start his own company? Well, again, Big strokes sure. and and, uh, and and some gaps in this, but and, and there there was a, a 
a couple of curves in, in George's career timeline that, that I'm aware of. And, and one was where he uh, actually moved to Los Angeles to start um, uh, a retail drum shop, which ran for, um, I don't know how long it was there for. Um, it's funny. I was just, um, I was just there and, and talking with Kerry Crutchfield who runs the Hollywood uh, custom and vintage drum show. And uh, he said, uh, this is where George's shop used to be. There's that address doesn't even exist anymore. There's a, a building that sort of spanned the, uh, those particular street addresses, but um, it was on, uh, I believe it was on Coenga. Um, but anyway, it was, it, 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 it wasn't very successful. And um, for whatever reason, uh, and, uh, I think it was after that that George uh, moved back and, and that was where he decided to, you know, again, start manufacturing drums, uh, but this time under his own brand. And that's kind of really important to remember. I mean, that he started out as a drum manufacturer. That was the, that was the first thing, you know, between the, the, the instruments and the sound effects he was making with stone to, you know, starting the advanced drum company. So, and I, you know, it, it was, uh, it wasn't anything new to him. No. And it's, it's cool. I'm seeing on your, on the history here, it says that he purchased, uh, the George way drum company. He purchased the factory formerly operated by cons Leedy and Ludwig division, um, in Elkhart, uh, Indiana. So, uh, that's pretty cool that he kind of moved in there and there's just so much history. Like this guy is just, he's involved in, you know, he's at the center of everything and it's, it's all revolving around these old companies. Yeah. Well, Elkhart, you know, I often say that's the, the crucible of, <laughs> of, you know, yeah. modern drum manufacturing and so much seemed to come out of that area. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so it seemed appropriate that, you know, he, he, uh, he set up shop there. Uh, when I take a step back and I look at, at uh, where he was going and if it wouldn't have been for, you know, one of his manufacturing partners, I can see where his company would have went on to become, uh, and I'm going to hazard a guess here, something something on par with, with where Ludwig is today. Hmm. Now, what happened there? What, what, what went wrong? Well, um, I can tell you one thing. It's, it's a, 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 an example of something that I've seen happen a few times since there, and, and there are some, you know, history repeating itself, but George was working, uh, one of his uh, suppliers was a, uh, a, a, a manufacturing, metal manufacturing company known as Camco. And Camco was owned and operated by this fella, shrewd dude, businessman named John Marchand. And essentially what happened was um, Rashawn had invested, uh, some money, uh, the, the, in order to raise money, George had sort of taken the company semi-public and, um, had doled out shares to, uh, a number of, you know, people he'd asked for money to sort of get this thing going. And, you know, Rashawn was one of them. And, uh, one day Rashawn went to George and told him that he had heard that, uh, some that there was going to be a hostile takeover mm-hmm. that someone was going around trying to buy up all of the, uh, you know, as many outstanding shares in the company as possible in an effort to take it over. And he suggested to George that, you know, what you should do is if we can do this is, you know, if we can consolidate all of those outstanding shares, um, you know, if you can go to the people that, invested in you and supported you and asked them to sell their shares to me, we can probably avoid this takeover. And so George did that. And, um, it's basically as soon as John got controlling interest in the company, he, uh, held a board meeting and, uh, you know, called George and Elsie and said, uh, okay, well, I got controlling interest in this thing now, and here's what we're going to do. And just, um, in one fell swoop, changed the entire culture of what George was doing. And, 
you know, I can, I can just see what was happening or George and Elsie looking at each other going. And I, I guess during this meeting at one point, you know, George said, well, people are going to think we're crazy. I mean, if you're going to do this, like, you know, we may as well not be a part of this. And Rashawn jumped on that and said, George, I'm glad you feel that way. Uh, let's make your last day Friday. Oh. And they went, whoa, they apparently they went home for lunch. And um, while they were having lunch at home, Rashawn recalled the meeting and said, okay, you know what? Um, actually, let's make their last day today and sent a, a, a courier or someone to his house while they were still having lunch and said, yeah, actually, you don't even have to come back. Man. And so, um, yeah, George was, uh, you know, he got screwed out of his company and, um, that was fairly late in his career. And, um, that is where, you know, camp code drums as we now know them started. So, I mean, they've always, um, that's always put a bit of a taint on the camp code brand for me, but, sure. um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess the good news is George um, and Elsie, I, I think it was at that point that he went back to work for, um, I think that might have been when he went to work for Rogers. And, and there were some legalities in, in in why he didn't just, you know, start the George Way drum company again. Um, but ultimately what he did was something similar to what uh, Ludwig did when they lost control of the Ludwig name and they started WFL. So he started, he started GHW. And uh, although he wasn't making drums, he was, uh, you know, again, basically selling um, parts and components and um, symbols and things like that. And uh, that was the, you know, the last stage of his career was, was basically being uh, a distributor. And uh, I think one of the last famous pictures of him, you know, was, was this huge array of products spread out all over the floor and, you know, him sitting in, you know, in the back corner, um, you know, was everything from symbols to snare wires to, uh, you know, everything. And that's, and that was, uh, wow. That was, uh, that was the end of his career. Man, that's sad. I mean, and, and uh, so one thing that I think he obviously has, countless inventions and things like that but i think the um just to to kind of so everyone knows the maybe everyone knows the the dw round lugs which would have been the turret lug which go back that was a part of camco which go back further than that that was the george way i mean so he invented things like that right i mean he was just innovative in creating these these things yep. like that so now you see him you just like you said you see his spirit in everything uh, i certainly do yeah, I certainly do. And and it was interesting, you know, I, I had a conversation with Don Lombardi recently and we were talking about the lugs and I had heard, there are a couple of stories. Don had heard that the, the design of that lug, what, what went on to become the turret lug uh, was a, a, an, a, based on an aluminum mouthpiece cap for a, a, a horn instrument. Really? Um, I had heard that one day, uh, George was on the phone at his desk and was absolutely absentmindedly stacking milk pogs on his desk and was looking at that stack and going, Hmm, that would make a, a, a cool lug either way. Um, it, it was actually, I believe I'm going to take a chance here. I think it was 57, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. cool. that George, uh, when working for Leedy, drew up the first, the the initial version, the his original version of that uh, lug, which wasn't called a turret lug at the time. And the difference was is that um, the one that he had originally designed had a couple of tabs, uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. So it wasn't actually like the round. Yeah, you know, perfectly round. It, it was it was more of an uh, an Art Deco based shape. Interesting. Um, yeah. Do you run into any issues using those round lugs um, on your drums with like you know patents or anything with against DW? No. Okay. Um, and uh, but of course, you know, 
listen, I, and, and a moment of complete honesty. I know that there's going to be lots of people listening to this part of it, <laughs> but, um, Don, Don has been a dear friend. I've worked with him NDW, uh, and, um, I adore him. He's been a mentor and I, 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 and, and that's coming from a, a place of, uh, love and respect for what he has accomplished. It, it's amazing what he's done. Um, you know, fantastic legacy and they've, they've made some beautiful products and I've, I've always been proud to have, uh, you know, worked with them and created some fantastic drums together with them. But yeah, this was a sticking point. I was going to have to look at it because DW did have, and rightfully so some, some IP um, intellectual property rights to that particular round lug. Yeah. Um, and so being as versed as I have had to become, (laughs) even though all I want to do is just make drums, I have to understand uh, intellectual properties and patents and trademarks. And I, I had a good, good, honest look at it. Um, and remembering I'm coming from a place here of, um, of complete honesty in, in that my intention was to uh, restore and preserve George's legacy and, and rebuild his company. And after racking my brains, uh, you know, knowing that at some point the tuxedo lug thing was going to run its course, I was going to have to find a way to do a single ended lug. And, and I did, I looked at, you know, can I make a single ended tuxedo? Is that going to work? Can I do this? And I just, there was no way to do it and keep um, the aesthetic and, 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 mm. and keep the George in it. Yeah, sure. And, and so that's when I, I, you know, ended up looking at what, what uh, Rob's book and the history and looking at some of those drawings. And I went, you know what? Um, his original lug with the tabs, yeah. was quite beautiful and striking and it was different. Yeah. Sure. Th- there's definitely some, there's some similarities, but it's different. Yeah. And I looked at it and I went, I don't think that there is any chance that anyone is going to ever be confused between a drum that has what I call the aristocrat lugs mm-hmm. on it and a cloud badge that says George way with yeah. a round lug drum that has a round badge that says DW. If, if, if you, if anybody is that um, lacking in knowledge of instruments that they can't, you know, if you can't spot the difference, um, then I can't help you. Well, but it's certainly not, it, it, I'm certainly not going to let it stop me from going ahead and doing what I wanted to do now. Um, yeah. They're high level drum sets. So if you're at that point, you can discern the two. Obviously. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I had, again, coming from a place of friendship and respect, I had a conversation with Don and, um, and Don gets it. Mm -hmm. Don gets it. And uh, ultimately, um, we found a way, um, a, a good compromise. And so, um, without getting into the details of that, everybody's good. Cool. Don gets it. I'm not trying to be DW with, with George way. I'm just trying to rebuild the company. I don't want it to, these drums to look like, or be, um, you know, ultimately compared to George's thing is George's thing. Yeah. DW and Don's thing. They're completely different. And, and, and I'll say this because I've said this, I said this to Don, Uh, after receiving all of George's estate and some of the absolutely priceless historic treasures that are in there. And uh, you asked me about that in a minute. Totally. Um, I I realized that, um, I I am just the caretaker of the brand. Yes. I bought it. Yes. I, I own the trademarks, but I'm not going to be making drums forever. I'm 57. Um, at some point, um, I want to see that brand to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. And, um, geez, wouldn't it be great someday to see that fantastic 
lineage of George Way, Camco, and DW just put back together. Wow, that's a that's a powerful thought that never even occurred to me. Wouldn't wouldn't it be though? Like I'm like going, and yeah. and so you can draw your own conclusions there, but uh, you know, Don Lombardi gets it. Well, yeah, with I mean, he's in acquiring Slingerland recently. He's obviously got a, a an eye for the historical, like a, a respect for um, history. Of course, he does. So um, that's that's a thought, man. I've never thought about that. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, that's, that's what I, 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 I put it to him in that way. And, um, you know, when the time comes, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. That would be the ultimate thing. <laughs> I think it was just, just to be able to take those pages of history and tape them back together in a book in a way that, that makes sense. So, yeah. Right. Um, right. The wrong that was done to George, uh, there towards the end of the company. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, you know, I don't know if George is uh, 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 watching from some, uh, uh, you know, a cloudy uh, vantage point or whether or or not. But I just think that anybody who is a drummer and appreciates the instrument would that would be so satisfying. Absolutely. Um, and I'm one of those guys. So, yeah. you know, that's that's where I'm coming from on this, man. Well, to. um to kind of uh, reading in the history here to read to, to wrap up George, it said in 1962 George starts the GHW Drum Company. Seven years later, on February 21st, 1969, um, George Harrison Way passes on. Um, so he passed away then. And then I think another thing I want to note that um, people can Google this, and I've always wondered this. And I'm gonna I'm working on a British drum company um, episode, but there's a company called Heyman H. A Y M A N drums, and they use round lugs, and they look identical to George Way and D W, and I think they're from the seventies. And I always wondered if there's any legality uh, stuff there because it's like it is it's it's a drum company with round lugs, and and uh, but it's British, so I don't know if it's because it's international patent stuff. What's up with that? But everyone should Google it. H A Y M A N. And you'll see like, Whoa, those are. Yeah. The Heyman love lug always comes into that. Um, patent and trademark and IP law um, is uh, mired in nuance and subtlety. And yeah. you know, you can't trademark a shape. <laughs> <laughs> Circle. So, yeah. so, so just because your lug is round, I mean, you know, I think of it in this way. There isn't a manufacturer out there who's made a lug, brass lug on a lathe, that if it's on a lathe, it's going to be round. Mm -hmm. And depending on, on how you look at it, you see a step in it. Okay, well, I'm not just going to make it some, you know, I'm going to put a step on the bottom and, um, and... So Heyman or not, I mean, there are some similarities. The first thing that, that the first similarity that's most obvious is, well, it's round mm -hmm. and there aren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of die cast lugs around that were around, but you, here's what I want your, your, your people to Google, go and look up round brass lugs and you will see so many mm. variations. Um, and I've done this myself that it's like, you know, let Heyman be only one example because sure. there's a lot of, sure. there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. So, um, cool. Well, I just wanted to throw that out there just cause you know, it's yeah. like a little, little, uh, um, uh, rabbit hole to go down for people, but, um, yep. Cool. Well, Ron, <laughs> why don't we kind of get towards the end of the episode here with how did you acquire all this? You were the owner. I mean, like you said, you've, you've acquired it. You've gotten all the trademarks and, and all that stuff. Um, what's that story? How did that happen? Some of my dealers had been asking me if I was ever going to do an entry level or a mid level drum, and I was reluctant to do it because I'd worked so hard to build the Danette brand up to be high end. Mm -hmm. But I'd, I'd, you know, open minded, and I considered it, and I went, well, what would a badge look like? And the first thing I did was I looked at that beautiful Art Deco cloud badge that um, George designed, and I you know, deleted the George way and put the net. And I looked at that and I was horrified. <laughs> I went, 
That is sacrilege. That's that wrong. is not going to happen. That uh, I I will not do that. And so, um, but in researching, um, you know, the origins of the badge and and everything, I came across uh, a name of this guy named Emmett McNeese, and um, who happened to be uh, the last owner of the of the trademark GHW. So I called this guy, and he'd run a, a sheet music store in. Uh, uh, in Elkhart and had a two hour long conversation with this fellow. He was very, he's since passed. He was a sweet guy, very old at the, at the time when I talked to him, he gave me the history of the store and everything. And, uh, at the end of it, I said, well, you know, Mr. McNeese, I, I, I would, I would love to buy that trademark from you. I, you know, I, I promise I'll do right by it and right by George's memory. And, uh, I don't, not sure that he really cared about that, but mm-hmm. he said, uh, well, I'll tell you what, um, here's what I paid for it. You write me a check for this much and it's yours. And, um, he had that check in his hand before he hung up the phone. And, um, and so, you know, that was the GHW, uh, trademark that, that I acquired, wow. but it's still left in question. What, where was George way that trademark? Yeah. And, um, again, having to do the research and get involved in the nuances of intellectual property, I, uh, um, that that trademark had never been registered. And because there had been such a long time, it was basically an abandoned trademark. And when I got a hold of it, anybody could have taken it. So it was really like finding a lottery ticket on the ground, <laughs> um, the winning one. And um, I've always said this, thank God it was me because I've seen a lot of heritage brands and I don't even have to name them just dragged through the mud Mm -hmm. and basically trashed, um, uh, with their, you know, all of their intellectual property and, and just left in tatters, you know, the, the, the beaver tail lug, the Swingerland, you know, that beautiful art deco design now just homogenized across the board. Um, really sad to see that, you know, being paired up with, um, five cent stamped bass drum claws and, and, uh, Pearl style spurs and uh, uh, round Gibraltar lugs. It's like, oh my god, my design sense just. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant um, to be, though. It found you. It, it, I, you know what? I think it was. And um, I, I uh, there's been a few naysayers and and you know critics. Um, you know, you always have to deal with those guys. Mm-hmm. And I go, well, you know what? I got a clear conscience. I know where, uh, you know, I lead with my heart and, um, uh, I love George way. Uh, he's, he's been a, never met him, but he's been a mentor th- to me, me through his work. And, um, I'm proud of, uh, a few things, but how I've rebuilt and worked tirelessly to restore that company, um, to where he would have, where I think he would have liked it to have been, um, I'm, I'm completely happy with that. Yeah, I think you're you're doing a great uh, service to it, and and um, I think uh, and you've got some great players. Um, I've seen uh, I actually recorded him a while ago, young drummer uh, Joseph Joe Mintz, um, who um, was uh, at the studio I work at a while ago, and um, he's a George Way artist. And you've got some other people who are just uh, very respectful and and just love what you're doing. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah. yeah, you're doing a great thing. I'm trying to, and it's not easy in this market. And, um, yeah, having rolled this ball up the hill for the last 12 years, ironically, it's, uh, it's now outgrown me. Um, yeah. it's become a, a little bit hard for me to manage, um, how big it's, become and grown and yet I still look at it and uh and the potential for it to continue to growing because it you know it's a unique brand and it's a unique product and uh yeah I hope I can find the energy to keep rolling it up the hill <laughs> well absolutely because to me it's like you see someone playing these or you see these and it's it's almost like a like an insider's club of um people who know about George, which now hopefully thanks to this, we're going to get that message out there a lot more, but, um, it's just like a, a, the truest, like, it's just as pure as it gets with drum, you know, heritage. Um, and you're the, the stuff you're doing is beautiful. 
Um, everyone, everyone can check it out at waydrums.com, W-A-Y drums.com. Um, and also, obviously, Ron is Danette Classic Drums himself, which you can go to Danette, D-U-N-N-E-T-T dot com. And um, obviously, you're on social media and all that stuff. And um, yeah, is there anything else? Is there anything cool you're working on right now you want to share with the audience? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> George Way wise, yeah. I mean, this has been a transition year for George where, um, you know, it's the it's the rebirth of the aristocrat lug um and all it came with it so it, it's just working hard to get um that out uh, i'm always working on something gosh i've been working on a pedal for nine years now wow. and um i'm getting i'm getting close to it um i kind of wonder <laughs> i could have bought a tesla with all the uh money that i put into <laughs> it but um uh you know hopefully it's going to pay off and um, um cool yeah, always got things work, you know, th- that I'm working on um, as far as Danette goes. But uh, George is the only thing I have left to do to complete the George Way catalog and and have it complete is the double tom holder, and um, I'm I'm working on that this year. So hopefully by next year, um, you know, someone's going to be able to walk up to a set of George Way drums at a dealer and go, you know. This is what a George Way kit would have looked like yeah. if it if if his company would have kept going. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Well, that's awesome. Um, and before we end here, I want to give a shout out to Seamus um, from Drum Gab because he, like I was telling you before, like a year ago, was telling me he's like, "Man, you got to talk to Ron. You got to get him on talking about George Way." And um, so, um, shout out to him for for kind of giving me the idea. And, and like I mentioned, other people along the way, I've probably had five people say to me like, "You should do George Way," and also we want to hear from Ron. Um, so, yeah. So, well, yeah. there were some there were some good questions in there. And uh, here's what I'm going to send a shout out to: if anybody is is truly interested in understanding your instrument, and it's only going to make you a better drummer in the end, um, and it's only going to make your experience playing the drums more fun. Um, Rob Cook's book, The Leedy Way, um, is just a fantastic, not, it's not just about George Way and Leedy, but it, it it really lays out this pageant, this lineage of the history of the drum. And there's things in there that you're just going to be surprised to know. This stuff didn't just, it didn't invent itself. Somebody no. had to do it. So um, I'd, I'd encourage you to go buy it. It'd probably be the best, uh, you know, 20, 30 bucks you'll ever spend. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Rob truly, uh, has become such a friend of this show where, um, an episode rarely goes by where we, uh, we don't talk about, about Rob. And, uh, I was telling you before, I just got a Christmas card from him today, which is like the coolest thing in the world from Mm. uh, getting a Christmas card from the Chicago drum show is amazing. But, um, if people want to hear a little bit more information about that and the, uh, the Leedy Way before you read it and buy it. Um, episode six is the history of Leedy Drums with Rob Cook um, here on Drum History. So you can check that out and get a, a little taste of what it's going to be like. We're lucky to have a historian like Rob Cook, and um, uh, and he's left us a his legacy is a beautiful one. He's left us um, he's done all of our homework for us. Yeah, left us a beautiful archive of uh, of uh, of you know. Absolutely. Three of drums, so. And a humble and nice guy and uh, and anyone can, if I can do it, if I can just start this and, and you know, start to be included in the community, then anyone can. So, um, yeah, cool. Well, Ron, I appreciate it very much. And like I said, I recommend everyone finds Ron online and keeps up with him on uh, social media. And, um, and that's it. Ron, thanks for being on the show. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I, I, I love talking about this stuff and, um, and, and this was a truly a, a enjoyable conversation. Excellent. All right, Ron. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye for now. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>